letting people. This meeting is being recorded. <laughs> yeah, we don't believe you. Got it, got it. Okay, the should be good on Facebook. So Lawrence, you can take it away. Okay. What happened? Suddenly my camera started acting crazy. <laughs> Holy cow. That's very strange. Interesting. Okay. I'm Lawrence Diggs. And um, this is Brainstorming the Human Connection brought to you by the South Dakota Humanities Council. And this is an interactive program. It means that even though we have guests, some very esteemed guests today, the people on the panel are part of our operation as well. Because it's interactive, that means that we would like you to uh, participate as opposed to be uh, just uh, bystanders, because that's what will make the, the uh, experience worth it is the interaction of questions that you have, comments that you have, insights that you have. All of those are very important to, to what we try to produce here. Uh, all of us will always be smarter and have more insight than any one of us. So all of us together uh, will make something that's a lot more interesting. That said, we, we last month was... Um, Poetry Month, and we, we spent a lot of time talking about poetry, and we're going to continue, even though the Poetry Month is over, because there's still lots of other kinds of writing, and there's lots of other things to cover. And one of the reasons is because poetry and literature offers us the opportunity to share experiences. And that share, those sharing of experiences is what gives us more connection to each other. And at least from my point of view, uh, that's a fuller life, knowing what you're experiencing and how you're experiencing that and seeing things through your eyes helps to deepen what I see from my eyes. And so all of us together, we can kind of crowdsource and help each other out. And this is designed to be one little part of that. Today, we're going to be talking about a, uh, a and about the experiences of and the and the work of a group that was that used to be called the Oak Lake Writer Society. And now it's called the Osheti Shakuen uh, Writer Society. And we're going to be finding out the kinds of things that they have done, the kind of things they are doing and hope to be doing. And uh, hopefully it will, it will gain them some interesting support from all of you and all of your network. Uh, my guest today is Tasi Yagnumpa Barando. Barando. Did I say that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, we're going to call it because it's uh, we're going to call it Tashi <laughs> and that will that will make it easier for you to uh, uh, and easier for me to, to say. Um, welcome, Tashi. Thank you for having me, Lawrence, and everyone with the South Dakota Humanities Council. It's good to be here. Great. We're going, and we'll, we'll, she will introduce uh, uh, at least one other person I see, and maybe some others that uh, she, uh, that have been involved with uh, this project right from the beginning, and uh, they will have, I'm sure, some uh, insight and comments and additions to to this conversation. Uh, let's start off, Tasha, by talking about what was the Oak Lake Writer Society, and now its new iteration. Can you take us through what that is and, and how it came to be? Sure. So uh, joining us today is also uh, Tate Walker, who is a member of the board of the Ocheti Shakuin Writer Society. And <laughs> we also have uh, Dr. Chuck Woodard. And 
Chuck is the one who, with Lowell Amiot and Elizabeth Cooklin, who actually founded the Oak Lake Writers Society. Um, it began actually out of the idea to have a space for Lakota, Dakota, Nakota writers, uh, tribal writers, to be able to talk about their writing and the, in the cultural and land-based aspects in a way that they aren't that we usually can't do in a majority society classroom or writers, um, you know, any of the other writers uh, opportunities that are out there. And so to be able to talk about things without having to overly, you know, contextualize or explain um, to, not that we don't learn from one another, but to really to be able to have uh, a way of decentering whiteness and that uh, assimilate assimilation policy that the government had and boarding schools had been shoving on onto us for a very long time. Our earliest writers, the Ochedi Shakuan literary tradition is over 200 years old. And some of the first writers actually wrote, a lot of them were da Dakota, um, and they were actually writing in Dakota uh, letters to one another when they were, you know, in the prison camps in, in what's now Minnesota. And so also the very first boarding school um, attendees uh, became authors as well. And so it's a very long tradition. Unfortunately, uh, our own people oftentimes um, actually aren't taught about our own literary tradition in our own schools. Um, and there's been great efforts to remedy that. And so it was in the 90s that the retreat started at the Oak Lake Field Station. And it was a very good place for us to start coming together. Um, the area around what's known as Oak Lake actually has a long uh, tribal history as well. Um, a tribal, uh, actually a violent tribal history of, of actually a couple massacres happening near there during um, the, what's known as the Dakota Uprising and the Dakota Minnesota War. And so people trying to escape um, starvation um, and who were hunted down. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's where it started. And then the society came out of those retreats and the networking and the anthologies and all of the work that we have been able to really, a lot of us do together. There's a lot of amazing projects and works of, of our members that involve other members. And so that's where we're at today. Um, in a couple years ago, before the pandemic, we had decided, uh, along with founding members of, of the Ochetti Shakuan Writer Society, of uh, Elizabeth Cooklin and Lydia Whirlwin Soldier and Nico Lee and and others who wanted, we met in Pierre actually, and uh, started talking about actually moving Oak Lake um, into an, a formal nonprofit and being na a fully Native-led, Native-run nonprofit. Uh, we felt it was it was just it was time, um, and we were very very glad um, to be able to do this before you know we still while we still had our founding members while we still had um, Dr. Woodard's guidance and you know because the question really became for us is you know we've had a great twenty it's now the thirtieth year I believe um, and but what's the next 30 going to look like and the 30 after that, you know, so really looking long term. While we still had the the benefit of the people who dreamt this up in the first place. So yeah. That's often very important to have that continuity from people who, you know, you pass the baton as opposed to suddenly the next runner starts running and has a sense that they have to recreate the wheel of uh, that can be uh, you can end up let's say you don't have the benefit of all of that uh, uh, history and and also the the experiences of people who have sort of been there, done that. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about Tashi for a minute. Tell us about your background and, and where where you've, you've come from. Um, tell us about your expertise, because that often gets lost in these things that, you know, the person who's talking has a lot of expertise and they've they've been over a lot of road themselves that gives them a certain authority to you know to what they say so i'd like to explore that a bit well i don't know that i have 
I don't have any wonderful credentials other than the fact that I have been very blessed as a tribal journalist and writer to get to hang out with the scholars and authors of the uh, Ochete Shakwin Writer Society. I came to SDSU, I'm, I'm Oglala Sioux uh, tribal member. We're also Ita Zipjo. I was born in Pine Ridge. Um, I'm a Livermont. And my mom's family, uh, so that's my dad's family. And my mom's family is actually a settler, uh, settler family. I believe I'm the sixth generation uh, when I go tend graves up in Castlewood at the cemetery. And my children, when my children are with me, they're the seventh generation. Um, and so I guess I had wanted to come to SDSU. Um, we were living uh, in Kadoka and I finished high school then in Sioux Valley High School in Volga, right outside Brookings. And with the idea that I wanted to go to SDSU. And so when I got there, um, I you know, was really blessed with a lot of amazing resources. Uh, Dr. Woodard and Dr. Taylor uh, in the English department, um, Dr. Ruth Harper, I served on a committee with her, uh, Dr. Lee and Doris Gallego um, with the journalism department. And so um, speaking of poetry, I actually had ended up switching from English to journalism because I didn't just wanna write poetry. <laughs> And what, what's really funny is uh, when I've been in the deepest parts of uh, any of my journalism work, I actually write poetry. Um, it's a way of channeling and figuring out any emotions and like it, it, it played a joke on me. I mean, it's, it's kind of funny, but um, so I was a student at SDSU and yeah, that's, and I kind of credit, I guess, the Ochete Shakuin Writers Society with finishing, um, not finishing, we never finish learning, but kind of the raising of me of sorts. Um, you know, I come from a Yeska family where a lot of stories and a lot of things have been lost. Um, and I really feel like for a lot of us, you know, our ancestors, we, to survive, we, they boxed up a lot of things. And what happened, you're talking about, you know, the baton passing, sometimes those, those boxes of knowledge and wisdom and language got lost, you know, in the shuffle of, of living. And so it's, it's been a very beautiful um, and challenging um, experience to be part of the writer society. Um, but I think it also shows the strength and the grace and the possibility of tribal organizations um, when you are that, when p good people have the land and the cultural knowledge to then share with other people. So that's a little bit about me. So now yeah. I get to be the executive director and, uh, <laughs> well, and tell us uh, about, tell us about how you got to that, that uh, position um, or place in your life. How did that happen? Sure. So the Oak Lake Writers Society, you know, um, Oak Lake is outside of white South Dakota. Um, which literally a town called White um, near the Minnesota border and it's near Brookings. And so Dr. Woodard, I think it was about 2010, he asked me to be part of the Brookings Reconciliation Council. And so since I was in Brookings, I ended up doing some of our web stuff and getting our books on Amazon and kind of uh, working with uh, the administrative um, staffing of a local businessman who allowed us to make use of those resources for the society. And so uh, they helped us with different financial things. And so um, I kind of knew where all the bodies <laughs> were buried, so to speak. Um, and so it just kind of ended up um, on my desk. So I was a board member and then um, our executive director was actually Dr. Sarah Hernandez when we started. And she, when she left SDSU, we kind of left, we kind of followed her out the door. Um, and said, okay, you wanna be our director? Um, and so as her career has grown and uh, she just has a book that's been published, um, we kind of, we traded um, about a year or so ago. Um, so she's on the board and I'm I'm the director, so. Okay, so you just kind of switch positions. We kind of switch positions. Yeah, the nitty gritty, um, you know, she's a professor, so that, uh, out of state now. And so um, it just kind of worked. I actually am mostly a homemaker at the moment. So it's, it's a good break for me to be able to do these things. Um, so I really appreciated the, especially during COVID. <laughs> so. Can you tell us a little bit about 
uh, more anyway about kind of the aim of of the uh, society. What you know, if you if you're to try to sort of encapsulate, well, what are we really trying to do? What's our mission statement, and what are the kinds of things you're doing to address that mission statement? Sure. Well, so maybe Tate also wants to chime in on this one, but when we reorganized, we actually went through our mission statement. We had a lot of meetings um, to build consensus. What are we wanting to do? What's our goal? And so it all has come back to, we wanna keep doing the retreats. Uh, we missed one year because of COVID, then we did it online. And last year we held it in November in Lower Brule, which was very well attended. Um, it was probably one of the best attended um, retreats that we've had in about a decade. And so it was very encouraging. Uh, people are very, very interested in, in being part of the work that we're doing. Um, and so going forward, you know, we constantly are asking ourselves that question, what are, what are we doing? <laughs> because there's so much good work to be done in these, in, in all of this that it can, we don't want to end up in the weeds, right? So what we're, we're still committed to a politically focused, and when I say politically, I don't mean like, you know, um, partisan politics. I mean, the essential nature of being people that are defined by treaties with the US government. And so that is a huge portion of what we do. So even though some of our writers, you won't see it, um, you know, just maybe brought, you know, just really spoken about, um, although some of our poets, uh, uh, you know, Laylee Long Soldier, for example, uh, has whereas, which is, you know, um, based on, on uh, historical documents. But it's really fundamentally just part of everything we do. I think I was telling you, Lawrence, uh, you know, when I first started getting my feet wet in journalism in South Dakota, I was quickly met with this idea that just because I mentioned treaties existed, I was somehow an activist. You know, one of my first editors told me, I don't want you writing about that Indian stuff. Um, you know, it, it was, it was just very quickly, like, cause it was considered a bias. Right. And so, it, I mean, like I said, just acknowledging historical <laughs> and modern cause treaties aren't in the past. They affect us today. Just saying that made, made me an activist and almost like unfit for journalism. And so, um, I did end up going into nonprofits cause once you get branded something, that's kind of what you do. Right. And so, but that's not how that's not the way with the society we, that's the that's where we all are coming from and so tate do you want to speak to that a little bit as a poet and as someone who has been part of the society about what it's like to be um an author with the society and and how you see where we're going because you are one of our board members and tate they also are uh on our social media team which i'm very glad to have because it's been <laughs> It's just been me and a couple other people for a long time, so. Sure, he <clears throat> hanly watched day, everybody. Um, yeah, so Tashi has almost single-handedly brought the society to where it's at today. And so I'm really grateful that she's at our helm. As a board member, I'm still just learning the ropes. I've been part of the society since 2012. And I've seen it grow so much with Tashi's leadership. So I'm really grateful uh, for all that she does. Um, I think uh, in terms of the impact of the society, it's it's the support that we get. Too often, and Tashi alluded to this, we're relegated to like <laughs> history, right? Or like <clears throat> very niche writers. Um, uh, you know, if you if you want a Lakota perspective, then you can do this versus here's a great poet. Uh, and so the society is is uh, active when it comes to promoting society members work. And for that, I'm just extremely grateful. We have members that are, are all over Turtle Island doing some amazing things. And when we can pull them into our retreats every year, it's it's, it's phenomenal. Uh, collaborations that are going on so I, I i think um yeah and we and we need help we need support uh from from our neighbors um as a board we're really focused on um, moving us into uh you know new generation of of our mission uh and that's going to be with collaborations like with the south dakota humanities council so really appreciate that you have us on today
Yes. And can you talk a little bit, either or both of you, about more specific things like, you know, you're, you're helping writers. Writers, of course, need help. There's lots of different kinds of help that writers need. Can you can you kind of get under the hood a little bit about the kinds of things that you are doing for writers and and the difference that it you you're hoping that it makes in in their sure. journey? So these are some questions we've been asking ourselves for a while, but a lot of the things we've been doing are actually also continuations of, of things that Chuck did and um, uh, Dr. Woodard and our allies with the Brookings Reconciliation Council. So when we talk, actually, when we also first organized, we, we thought to ourselves, okay, have we become like a professional association or are we still a non, like, are we a nonprofit? That was actually one of the things we talked about because we really are so, so um, focused on our craft and, and uh, the networking and that kind of thing. But we are still a nonprofit. And the reason being is because of the disparity um, we have some of the most amazing tribal scholars are in the communities without the access that some tribal members do get as academics, um, and they work very, very hard to get there. Um, and those community voices and those community um, scholars are the ones that really have, have um, really shaped a lot of what the society is. So one of the specific things we did, you might have noticed um, with the Festival of Books this year, is anyone that was on a panel, we made sure that they had travel stipends um, and room and board in a safe, appropriate um, um, hotel. And you know, we worked with Jennifer at the South, South Dakota Humanities Council to see what we could do to make these things happen. Um, Sometimes, you know, you get to the place as an author where you have publishers and you have um, maybe literary agents who help pay for things. But if you aren't, um, then that's something that we step into and we're trying to help with. So it's really that parity, um, creating a uh, financial parity. The retreat is always free. <laughs> it's not free to the society, but it is free to the attendees. And so it's expected that, you know, you're going to take it seriously. and. And, um, and travel stipends are also available. Um, sometimes it's, you know, it's based on what money we have, um, but we are, you know, we definitely are putting, um, putting that resource there. And we're also, we do as much as possible to make sure it's also not something that people will get three months from now. It's actually something that they can use in the moment. Um, they don't have to worry that they're gonna have to, you know, have receipts and, you know, because access, you know, I, I was part of a project actually just recently, even myself, and they wanted me to go somewhere and speak and do things. And I'm like, we'll pay you back. I was like, I can't attend. Sorry. <laughs> I can't go out of state and do all this stuff. Um, you know, so, but thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Like, I appreciate it. But so um, that's something because we're, you know, native run, native led. Um, it is our, our cultural responsibility to our scholars and our storytellers to make sure that they have the things they need to do the work that they do. And so um, it's, so, you know, it's to us, it's not like charity, you know, but the nonprofit vehicle is the, the best way we can come up with it. And I'm actually very proud that a lot of our own members or other tribal writers actually, um, if you look at like how many, like who all is donating to our nonprofit, it's actually by headcount, mostly tribal people. And I think that's fantastic. Um, you know, we've had some wonderful gifts from foundations and things. So, um, you know, dollar wise, but as far as the, the number of them, and I think that's, that speaks very strongly to the type of work we're doing that we're, we're doing work, you know, um, the people, our own people who I think probably have the best BS detectors <laughs> anywhere. Um, and so if they trust us to, to make a donation, I, I, I feel really good about that. I know I'm doing something right and the board's doing something right. So this is Gabrielle. Oh, this yes. Is Gabby. Gabby. <laughs> Hi, Gabby. Hi. This is Gabrielle Tateyushkashka, and I, I think one of the important things that the Writers' Society provides is support. Uh, once you are in the publishing process, it's often difficult to maintain cultural accuracy in writing because the editors just don't know from the publishing houses. 
And I'll give an example of an issue I had recently is um, I'm part of five writers who are all descended from Charles Eastman, who uh, Minnesota Historical Society Press published um, one of Charles Eastman's unpublished manuscripts. And, you know, some of the writers were pointing out that there's some inaccuracies in his manuscript and that needs to be explored because this has been happening for a long time. And I'll give the example as um, their origin narratives and in the narratives, he has characters like Princess Frog, Princess Toad. And so if you're talking about origin narratives, um, those wouldn't have existed. Those concepts of royalty wouldn't have existed in those times. So were they trying to, at the time Charles wrote the manuscript, he was a student at Dartmouth. So was he trying to make it more pal palatable to American society? Because that was also during the time when um, the Civilization Fund codes and um, Pratt and people in the education institutions were trying to eradicate language and literacy for um, many tribal groups. And so was that the reason that he, he put concepts in there that aren't actually in the origin stories? So with other Oak Lake writers, we can have those discussions. How how do we address some of those issues that the larger society doesn't know that native writers have to um, contend with when working with publishing companies and their editors who are, although some of them are very knowledgeable, they still aren't um, native people who have cultural accuracy and know what is accurate and what isn't. And, um, it, it also broadens the discussion too, like what is what is happening in publishing and um, are my words actually getting published or is it an editor playing with semantics to make something, you know, a sentence look good and then changing the meaning of what you're trying to say. So it, in those ways, I think the Oak Lake writers are very important because we can stop some of those things that happen in publishing today. You know that it, what you, you're saying, it, what you're saying, Gabrielle, really reminds me of the power of the press, and how that, how who owns the press, is has a lot to do with what gets established as reality, and it, it, it's one of the interesting things about how technology democratizes reality in some way. In other words, now, now you can publish a book. And you don't have to be one of the five richest people to own a press. Whereas when presses first came out, very few people had a press and access to a press. Now, lots of people have it and lots of ways to get that message out. And so now, you know, we can we can appreciate the kind of insight that that folks like you can bring to the discussion so that we have a better view of a rounder view, a more complete view of of what's uh, what's being said. That said, I would like to open it up at this point to others on this uh, Zoom conference to to share uh, their ideas, or if you have questions, uh, experiences, any kind of comments, uh, please join in with us. Betty? You know me, I'm always first with the button jumping here. Uh, I would like to know when the retreats are held, and if you have one scheduled yet for this year, uh, when and where, and then uh, maybe a, a web address or whatever to join the society, please. So our retreat this year will be in September. I believe it's the, the second weekend, and it will be in the Black Hills. Pending funding, we're figuring out where. <laughs> Um, so if you go to our website, the Ocheti Shakoan Writer Society, uh, just Google it, um, you can join our newsletter. Um, if you are a member of one of the Lakota, Dakota, Nakota tribes that made up the Ocheti Shakoan Oyate, you can go into the, um, just look for membership and there's instructions there on how to apply for membership. Um, there are 
if you haven't, you do, you do need to be a member um, of a tribe or um, status um, in, in Canada, but, and you also need to be published. But if you have the one, um, if you're a tribal member, but you're not published yet, um, get a hold of us. Um, I think I actually became a member. I was still a student, but I was public, you know, I was writing for the SDSU Collegian and Chuck, um, you know, invited me and then I ended up in an anthology. And so, you know, the ways in which we um, consider publishing, the thing we have kind of put our foot down on is if you only, and I'm a blogger, so I say this with lots of love, if you only blog without any sort of editing process, or if you're publishing without any kind of um, edit, editing, um, you know, or, uh, you know, working with other people, um, that's kind of when we go, mm, but still, I mean, no shame. We, we don't, we don't do that. <laughs> well, let's get you published then. Um, and speaking to the, the conversation we were just having, there's actually a number of small presses and larger presses, even, you know, Joseph Marshall, he was, uh, the third was the, uh, our mentor the year, first year I attended. And he regaled us with the conversation about, um, the journey of, I believe it was the journey of crazy horse. Wasn't it Chuck? Or was it the one before that? I think the journey of crazy horse. Yeah. I think it was. And so he had run into it. Uh, he had a great editor. Um, I think he was with penguin publishing, but they really wanted him to footnote a lot of non-natives in his writing and everything that he was doing was based on oral of his grandparents and family and extended Tiosh Bayets. And so he really, him and his editor, his editor, you know, heard him and they really went to bat. And so you'll see at the end of the book, a list of all these works about Crazy Horse. And that was the caveat. That was, that was the compromise was, okay, we'll put this list in the back of the book, but I am not footnoting to prove what my grandparents said based on what some white person or majority culture person wrote. So um, that, th uh, that is, that's um, it, it. And also, I would also like to mention, Gabby briefly spoke on the uh, Native American um, civil codes and Google it. it. Wikipedia has a really good actually page on that. I That was um, information that I learned directly from Gabby because I was part of the society and it will blow you away. Um, and most of these things, you know, we have to also understand that like the Sundance and various things, you know, actually wasn't decriminalized. And I literally mean decriminalized until 1976. And I was born in 1982. <laughs> you know, that that's not a lot of time. Like what we're looking at, what we're able to be doing right now is, is really um, the fact that you're just learning about it. I mean, there's a very long established history of, of keeping this information and writing and works. And like Gabby said, our early works, um, there's some antiquated language and there's also some themes and they, the reason, the reasons why is a subject that we're as tribal writers unraveling today. And, um, so it's, it's all very, you know, um, important work for us to do as writers ourselves. Anyone else have uh, something they want to add to this conversation? <laughs> Gabrielle, you were you going to say something? Well, oh, no, I was just going to um, say how important it is for cultural authenticity to be able to work with um, published writers because, you know, because I, I did talk to Joseph Marshall about the issue I was having. So it's good to have other published writers help you through um, some matters that come up when you're trying to get your work published and make sure that you know it's your true voice and so the oak lake writers have been really important i think in making sure that that happens for the writers that are publishing and i think you also see it in recent works like nick estes's um our history is the future uh he is a member of the oak lake or let's see we're all doing that oak lake oh chetty shockwin writer society um, and he writes about um, the work, um, you know, Elizabeth Cook Lynn and Joseph Marshall. Um, Joseph Marshall actually was one of our, he came, mentored us again um, at the, on the virtual retreat, which is, I think, part of what Gabby's speaking to and, and visited, actually looked at people's manuscripts. And so that's part of what we do at the retreat is, is trade writing. Um, Dr. Sarah Hernandez just came out with We Are the Stars, 
um, which is about women and the early um, missionizing work and how it has shaped the Dakota literary tradition. And she spearheaded the Native Reads campaign um, when she was our executive director. And we were the cultural, we were the community group for that project. And you can find that on our website. She also has worked with, um, I see a comment here from Emmeline Weber, who is the library operations manager from SDSU, uh, reminding me that, um, yes, the society's papers are archived at the SDSU archives and special collections, as is Elizabeth Cook Lynn's papers. And so, you know, these are a lot of the different things that we've been doing is working also with libraries and collections. Um, there's another librarian in Minnesota um, who is working with, I think it was you and you, Gabby, and Diane Wilson, right? Um, yes. To get that anthology out that's really wonderful. Um, and we had a great conversation about the fact that the Dewey Decimal System does not know what to do with our language and our titles and how we do things. Um, so there are finding out that there's ally librarians out there who are, are thinking about these things. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's um, just a lot of really good work and I don't think people realize the underpinning, how much, how much work really is going into these things. Um, and we don't really like culture-based. I mean, we say we're culture-based, really we mean land-based. Um, and part of that always is the independent, um, you know, vision of someone and being surrounded by their relatives um, that nobody does anything completely by themselves. And so I think that's a really important thing. And sometimes that happens in academia. Um, I, People get a little, little. Uh, I think irritated with me sometimes when I say this, but again, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm just a journalist <laughs> of sorts. But I think what I've seen, at least as a student, is sometimes people get marginalized. It's accidental. It's well-meaning. It's oh, okay, awesome. Can you serve on this? Can you do that? And because, like I said, we're dealing with this whole majority culture thing. What happens is, is we lose touch with our our uh, colleagues and our fellows who are also in the trenches. And so this was something through Dr. Woodard and uh, Dr. Amy and Elizabeth Cooklin. That's, I mean, it stopped um, with us um, of that happening. And so, you know, we definitely are, because people have been self-publishing, people have been doing things for a very long time, but having this resource. And so, um, yeah, I would also like to, can I call out my, uh, Sue Chastity, Edward is also, I think here, uh, Alondra. Um, Ed, are you still with us? I am. I'm here. Awesome. Um, so Ed, Ed has been, <laughs> when I actually, I think the first retreat and he came up to me and he said, we're relatives. And like I said, I kind of, you know, I kind of come from this Yeska family and I moved around a lot and I was like, oh, and he was able to tell me like exactly how we were related. And it was, it was such, um, because I, you know, in today, I, I tell my kids, I, it was still not cool to be Indian when I was a kid. Um, and if you were pale, you kind of were expected to pass. And if you didn't, what was wrong with you? And so um, having that experience. And so um, Ed's book, um, Dr. Valandra's book is, he wrote a book that is so foundational and now he's working in restorative justice. And so Ed, do you want to speak up a little bit about book banning? <laughs> And, and how to get in issues of publishing. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Hakaji. And uh, also I got some, uh, I want to give a shout out to Chuck, uh, Dr. Woodward and uh, Gabby and others, Hate. Um, yeah, it's a very, it's a very per perilous time in, in, in this country with respect to uh, books that address issues of uh, social justice. Um, and I work for a small press and um, we get reports from the field about various states having to pass laws that actually impact the sales of our, our books because a lot of them deal with issues of uh, race, um, sexism, uh, you know, the trans community. Um, and so we get a lot of field reports about uh, the, the banning of books, our literature from our press. Um, 
And, you know, and, and, and I might just say right now that South Dakota is not exempt from that. You know, all those settlers in South Dakota have, um, by and large, are buying an anti-critical uh, race theory, um, conspiracy theories about replacement. I know that uh, the settlers in South Dakota, not all, I'm not saying all, but a good majority of them are against the, uh, are revising the social study standards. And the Oak Lake, I mean, excuse me, the, the Ochete Shakoe Writer Society has great literature about the Lakota, Dakota, and Lakota people. And I can see where South Dakota, uh, pushing its white curriculum will not necessarily uh, have these books uh, for, for the readers in elementary school, junior high school, high school, and even college. So that's it on book banning. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to ask a question of all of the folks who are part of that project and maybe others too that might have some insight into this. Given what you just said, Edward, that the it seems that we should have some kind of mission to make sure that these books don't disappear. Not that they just aren't uh, available for sales. That's a that's an important thing. They aren't available in schools. That's an important thing. We need to address that. But when people ban books, they're trying to disappear the information. And I'm just curious, it's like, what kind of efforts are people or could people be involved in to make uh, permanent as permanent goes, uh, make more permanent and first of all, make more accessible, widely spread? How do we how, how do we, we shore that up? Gabriel, did you have something you wanted to say? Yeah, I, th I think it's really difficult, but one of the things is e education. And when you block avenues and put barriers to education, that makes change in society happen even more slowly. So, you know, I guess in South Dakota, the only thing you can do is talk to people who are involved in government. And we have um, state representatives that are um from the Ocheti shot going and make sure that, you know, our voices get heard, that we're not pleased with those standards. And there's reasons why they need to be changed. And it's important, you know, for to educate young people and to have societal change. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm thinking, you know, that, I'm, go ahead, Tashi. I think something that is also really important um, and I can kind of speak to this um, is a lot of the national um, culture wars that have entered South Dakota. Um, and we see, you know, Brookings right now is an influx of people moving here for um, our supposed uh, freedom uh, from masking and, uh, you know, whatever else our uh, um, people are talking about. I don't want to get you guys in trouble by, by speaking too strongly, but um, there's definitely this, this uh, insistence by our state leadership to dive right into these these culture wars on um, trans students and um, you know the supposed you know yeah the conspiracy theories around uh, uh, race and and some things and I think what concerns me the most um, as this from the South Dakotan side um, as well as being a tribal member is we're losing the prairie populism, and now populism has also become a dirty word for some good reasons, but prairie populism that really kind of defined the, the attitudes of neighbors. And I'm not saying it was ever perfect. Obviously, there's a lot of issues. But uh, Dr. Valandra, he has um, brought forward a wonderful video that was that was done um, by allies in the 60s um, when it came to uh, the state trying to take over uh, uh, tribal lands. And so it was tribal leaders and then they, they had an, an ally do the, the narration and it was an ad that was, that was um, sent out on, on uh, television broadcasting. I'm trying to think, was it an ABC or something? Uh, and 
So, and you could see some of that in what the allies, because it was all done through ally settler uh, lens for people. And eventually um, the state did, it, it was put to referendum. So for example, our referendum process is deeply under attack and that comes from our prairie populism and the, the ideals of democracy. And, um, and I'm, I'm just saying that because I think sometimes people in majority culture, you know, when tribal people are talking about these things are like, well, what can we do? What does that have to do with us? And I think it would be really important for people to just sort of dig deeper into um, some of the good things that we, we do have in South Dakota uh, majority culture that's not necessarily from the national. Um, we also have the Native Reads program that was uh, funded by the First Nations Development Institute with, the doc with Dr. Sarah Hernandez. That's on our website. Um, it is, there is a children's uh, book list and a lot of the books on the main list are um, also would be appropriate for K to 12. I'm answering a question that's in the chat, but there is a lot of really good work. I would also like to commend the South Dakota Humanities Council for having a work by a tribal member two years in a row as the one book South Dakota. So last year was Nick Estes's uh, Our History is the Future and this year is Diane Wilson's uh, Seed Keeper and both of them are members of the Chatty Shaco and Writer Society. So, you know, I think there's a lot of good things that are happening. Unfortunately, like I said, we're seeing, we're seeing it such a huge pushback that, um, you know, it is concerning. Um, and all we can do is keep doing what we can do in our little small corners and, and sharing with one another what we're all doing. I think um, I, with, you know, programs like this, Lawrence, um, I think that's, you know, it's so crucial right now. Uh Erica had a question and she asked, what books uh, would you recommend for K-12 teachers to read? So whenever anyone asks me about one of the younger books, and I'm not sure if this is on our list or not, but I would say if you want to title The Trickster and the Troll by Virginia Driving Hawk Sneavy. And I, I would strongly suggest this book. Um, she actually, it, it's a story of Iktomi and a Norwegian troll. And she very gently, there's a lot of culture, uh, Lakota cultural references that um, if you don't know, you don't know, but then there's the more overt. And it's really looking at how do we live together? And of course she married a Norwegian. Um, and so her children, she was writing this uh, for her children. And so that's a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, and I, it's an early chapter book too. Um, so that it's not just like a picture book, which I think is really important to have those. And I would suggest all the adults read it too. It's, it's really good. Um, yeah. So, and, and there's other books, like I said, if you go to our website, Ochetti Shakwan Writer Society. Um, yep. Yeah. Firstnations.org slash native reads. Um, we'll have all of that. And we also did actually study guides for all the books that we chose and those are available and all of that is is free um and they were written by tribal writers members of the Ochai Shakwan Writers Society mm -hmm. now before I forget if you are uh trying to keep track of all this stuff it could be pretty tricky so over in the chat you can uh, click on the open the chat and down at the bottom where you see the little, next to the little smiley face you'll see three dots if you click on that you can uh uh, copy the chat to and save it to your desktop. So you might want to go in and, and click on that so that you have all of those links that uh, I think Jennifer is so kindly putting into your into into the chat. Um, and that brings me to what kinds of things can people do personally, you know, to protect the information? Because, you know, I, Sometimes we look to like institutions to let's say, you know, and that, that's, a, that's a thing. I'm not pushing that aside, but I think that often there are things maybe personally that we can do uh, to, to, let's say, to, to make sure that these books exist, even to the point of what kind of paper that is printed on or, or where we put it, how do we protect that book um, if, you know how do how do we make sure that the books don't uh, get thrown out in the garbage when we when we are no longer alive? Well, we have floated some ideas about a bookmobile um, and some other things. 
So I would just, you know, strongly suggest, you know, buy books, gift them. Um, and then, you know, if people don't want them, um, you know, let us know, let somebody know, uh, find somebody else who wants them. I usually we lo I lose, I've been trying to like guard my books <laughs> because I do have some that are like out of print now and stuff, but, um, you know, like do what you can to get them circulating. I think that's what's really, that's really important. And then, um, you know, supporting the publishers um, like Living Justice Press, um, Red Media, uh, Nick Estes, he also has a, him and his uh, colleagues also have a new imprint for publishing that you can support on Patreon. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of ways to become a patron um, of, of tribal uh, works. And, you know, I think just usually librarians, um, you know, especially in Brookings and SDSU, they, they know what's up, but encouraging some of the smaller libraries. I have been to libraries in, in Western South Dakota that didn't carry these books, didn't know what to do with our books. Um, and a lot of the libraries that tribal people have access to don't always have the best tribal books. There's often this idea and it's, it's I mean, I mentioned it in journalism, but it's still a thing um, with this other work is that we can't write about ourselves without bias. And I, you know, and I think, well, what would Shakespeare say about that? You know, he's too biased to write about England, I guess. Um, you know, it, it's 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 such a crazy thing to say, um, but it's that idea is out there. Um, you know, so I would just you know encourage people to to uh, read the books and then rank them. I think probably one of the, this is this sounds crazy, but go on Google, go on. Goodreads, go on Facebook, find the books and rate them. Amazon, I mean, wherever they're at, leave reviews. Um, hopefully they're nice reviews. <laughs> um, keep in mind, I would say some of the, uh, Elizabeth Cooklin has always been really good. She talks about how she really loved the English language as much as she criticizes it um, and you know critiques it. She, she really thinks we should know the rules and then we can break them. Um, and so to kind of keep, keep that in mind. Cause like Gabby was saying there, there isn't, there are efforts to um, when we describe things and how we are writing about things. Um, so, you know, and if it's self-published, you know, you might see some, some typos or some, you know, <laughs> so be kind, but, um, but overall just, you know, it's, it's a new imagination. I think that's kind of the best way to, to read it is to, you know, go in assuming you don't know too much and, and really just be curious, like let curiosity guide you. Um, if you're a person of faith, even like, you know, let your, you know, ask your greater power for help. Um, like, just be really, really curious. Um, and do you mind if I share that quote right now, Lawrence, actually? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. I mentioned it to you and it was funny. I was running around this morning trying to find the book and luckily I'd taken a picture of it. So, um, this is a quote. So I was on the Native Reads Committee and and like I said, growing up and even in South Dakota, we didn't, I didn't always know what books were safe. Like my mom, um, who's, you know, settler, she, she had gone to Black Hill State and had actually done like a minor in American Indian studies. And so she knew that there were sometimes some books that weren't so great. And so I was always like, not really sure what books were okay or not. So Nick Estes speaks to this, like, there's a lot of us. Gabby talks about, you know, she, they all knew, you know, were related to Charles Eastman. So they had those books, but some of us didn't, didn't have that. And so I got to read through a whole bunch of books with a different knowledge while we were doing this Native Reads Committee to choose these books. And so Luther Standing Bear actually isn't one of our selections, but we read him. And um, he was one of the, he was one of the first in the class, Lakota um, to Carlisle. And he wrote quite a few books and you will see actually throughout his work, how it changes from being very conciliatory in many ways to being a little more criticizing. And so at one point he became an educator in Pine Ridge and he was wanting to like teach in both, both languages, Lakota and English. And he was just dealing with all these things. And so anyway, um, he writes, uh, he, he writes about how uh, the boarding school uh, and, you know, it, the program was Kill the Indian, Save the Man. 
and he was actually like a star student. He went around and told everyone how he was actually a recruiter for, for Carlisle um, at one point as, as a young person. And so he really believed in, in, in education and furthering his education. He saw it as an extension of being a, a warrior, actually. So, but he, he laments that white people just wanted to make over Indians into their own image. So he's using that biblical, you know, uh, idea. And so he writes, so we went to school to copy, to imitate, not to exchange languages and ideas, and not to develop the best traits that had come out of uncountable experiences of hundreds and thousands of years living upon this continent. Our annals, our all happenings of human import were stored in our song and dance rituals, our history deferring in that it was not stored in books, but in the living memory. So while the white people had much to teach us, we had much to teach them. And what a school could have been established upon that idea. And I think that's, I think we can kind of actually get there now uh, with all the resources that we do have. Um, we can actually uh, have, you know, there's so much misinformation. Um, there's so many ideas that, you know, um, when tribal people are talk about any treaties or any of the things that were just, you know, living in the past or, or, you know, something like that. And it, it's so not true. Um, and I, I really would like to just invite everyone to um, just, yeah, have that, have a new curiosity, um, you know, a curiosity that's not based in, in fear. Um, you know, some people I know on this program, when Nick Estes was on, someone had asked, oh, this land back, land back. Oh my gosh, you're just going to take my lands. And it, and we all kind of chuckle and go, well, like, yeah, because <laughs> there are, but not, not the way you think. Um, and so there's very much, I think this fear, um, and you know, when we sit around the table, we actually say white people are afraid that we're going to do to them what they did to us. And I don't think culturally that that it, that's not how it would work. You know, um, we want, you know, we want jurisdiction over federal lands and, you know, there's all these other, there's all these ways of thinking about it. Um, and so, like I said, just that curiosity would, would I think help people a lot and just buy the books, buy the books and give them as gifts, get them to the kids in your life. Um, you know, it, you know, Luther Stanberry was saying, you know, we don't write it down in books. Well, then we started to, he did, he was one of the first ones. And so, you know, these are very important and the resources that go with them that people create like native reads. So. I think that the thing you're saying is so important, Atasu, because these things begin with the kind of efforts that, that, that you guys are doing, you know, they don't, they don't begin in some grand project. They begin sometimes at, over a coffee table or a dinner table, and somebody has an idea, it grows to an organization, and then there are people who actually put boots on the ground and actually go out and, and pen to paper and actually go out and do the work and, and go out and, and plant the seeds. And that's what I'm, I was kind of driving at in terms of archiving the material in, in not only what you say, but what you do, but also like in, in, in media, meaning the, the materials that are more likely to survive time and putting them someplace where they're they're likely to pop up even when people think they burned them all you know because it, hey it's it's happened before it is happening while while we speak you know it's just like it's just revving up but we're not hope we're not helpless i think you know now we've seen that movie before deja vu all over again as someone once said we can we we could have a response and I think I'm I'm very happy to know that there are organizations like yours that are at least positioned to have a response. We're getting near the end of our our wonderful hour here, and I'm wondering if there's any last uh, last words that you would like to to leave us with. Well, I would you know you're talking about a repository. I do think it would be wonderful if. The society at some point could have our own retreat center and library um, and archives. I, I do think that that would be a wonderful thing. I'm not too overly worried about it. Um, 
Ella Deloria said, you know, we are not afraid. We have relatives. And everything that we're talking about, these books, they come from the humans and the relatives that um, have continued who survived. And so everything that we're doing, even what Luther Standing Bear did, you know, there is a great <clears throat> national governmental military strike against uh, our all of our stories, all of our uh, history, our language, our our imagination, and we've you know we survived, um, and it still exists today. And it's through the people, it's through the relatives, um, and so even if they would find all of our books and burn them. Um, there's still people that are coming together. And that's actually a lot of what the society is doing. Like I said, you know, learning from Gabby, we learn from one another. And oftentimes, well, one of the, the defining things when we changed the name was Ed reminded us that there used to be a saying, nation before reservation. And unfortunately, the reservation system often has kind of created this Lakota, Dakota, um, there's, there's differences, but then there's also kind of some attitudes, you know, <laughs> and um, our society gets beyond that and we can learn from each other, but it's, and we share what we've read. So as long as there's still the people who've read the things and who learn the things, um, you know, I, I'm not too, too worried. And there's also the idea that the land is teaching us still. And so, you know, that's something that's, that's, um, you know, immemorial. So um yeah but still, well, thank you so much books are good <laughs> but I, yeah, yeah. thank <laughs> you thank you so much we, we've actually come to the end of our hour now and uh i want to thank you so much for sharing uh your insight and what you guys are doing and invite our panel to join us next time next week same time same zoom channel and uh, we'll explore another exciting connection and brainstorming the human connection. Goodbye.